Check one, two. Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles with the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Welcome to podcast episode 287. It is a nice, bright Monday morning as I record this episode. I hope everybody had a great weekend. It was the first weekend of football. I really don't have a team this year because my Peyton Manning retired. He decided to give his shoulder and pads and helmet up for a robe, which, quite frankly, I like the robe concept myself. So go Peyton. Anyway, here we sit with five questions sent in by real estate investors, and I'm going to get to them. Try to answer them. And remember, if you have a question, send it to support at michaelquarles.com. We'll get it asked and answered. Here we go. Question number one. Currently, we are printing, sending out yellow letters to several markets, specifically the hot trending zip codes. We find that all the calls and or sometimes use an voicemail message VA to take the calls with mixed success. Not sure what that meant. Using your call center is very attractive to us. We would like to step up our yellow letter sending, and we were wondering if there was a limit to the number of calls your call center can handle. Does your price include the responses generated by sending one to 2,000 letters or more per month? We would print, send a portion ourselves and use your services for the other portion. Well, that's not really a real estate question. I apologize, but let me get through it really quick. Not to bore you guys, but it sounds more like a we want to hire your call center. For those of you that don't know about my call center, as a coaching student, as someone that's in the gold coaching program, we allow you to use my actual Alex system. So the guys and gals who work in my call center answering my phones, we actually have them answer the coaching students' phones as well. It really works out really, 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 really well. Because what happens is, is my Alexes are trying to stay on script. You know, they answer the phone live. They call the people back if, they, if the person called after hours or on weekends. They call them back. They either try to obtain the information, find out if they have a house to sell. If they have a house to sell, they'll go through this very long script of questions and answers and objection handlers, all that kind of good stuff. If we don't set an appointment, say the, the seller wants full value, we're going to call the seller back at 15 days, 30 days, 60 days, and 90 days on behalf of the, the coaching student. There is a minimum. You have to spend $1,500 a month in marketing with yellowletters.com, and we only answer the phones from the marketing there. We don't answer phones from bandit signs or billboards, those kinds of things. We try to keep it what we're proficient at. It's only $97 a month, so it's not a money maker for us. What we're trying to do is, is help you close deals, and we're getting overwhelming success. I mean, it sounds like a commercial now. I apologize. But just this weekend, someone tagged us in our Facebook group. We have a Facebook group for all the coaching students who said, my coaching and my call center has been paid for. Apparently, we got him a deal. He went out there and made, I think it was 6500 bucks on a wholesale deal. Or maybe it was a Simon, I'm not sure. But he was happy that more than all of his investment has been returned to him, and now he can cont continue down the path of making more money. It's always a good feeling when you receive back your your investment, and now it's it's clear selling from there. And basically what we did is we took a seller that had a house that ARV'd at 130. They thought it was worth 30 today. They ended up we ended up negotiating them down to, to 15. He bought it for 2500 so he went further than we did over the phone, which is the whole concept. Then I guess sold it for a nine thousand dollar assignment. So that's not a bad day for him, not a bad day for us. I like the success stories, but you can you can mail out as much as you want as a call center member. And in order to get into the call center, you have to be a gold coaching student. So you get the six months of gold coaching, you get the accountability coach, you get all the classes. Right now we're up to 62 classes a month. That's incredible. We are doing a lot of classes every week. The, really, the, the goal here from my perspective is, is I want to get you guys and gals buying houses. And let's face it, if I can buy a house in another part of the country, never seeing the seller, never seeing the house, 
buying it completely virtually, buying it through people that have never bought a house for themselves before. Those are my Alex, my Ryans, my angels. Then I know I can teach you how to do it too. Let's face it. It's just repeating and repeating and repeating. The outcome will stay the same as long as you whatever you're doing works, and I know it works. So when I saw for the commercial, there it was. Question number two, do you have a discounted yellow letter rate? Oh, my goodness, this is all about... Yes, we do. You get a 15% discount. You got to buy a platinum card, but the platinum card's nothing in comparison, and you get a 15% discount throughout the year. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. Are you running out of leads? It's time you tried Yellow Letters at yellowletters.com. Get motivated seller leads through yellow letters, postcards, zip letters, typed professional letters, greeting cards, door hangers, and business cards. Yellow Letters is a full-service marketing company created with your success in mind. Get the personal attention you need to get your direct mail campaign started and get in touch at yellowletters.com. And we are back in three, three, two, two, one. one. Question number three. When we get a lead that does not want to sell for cash, how do you recommend handling the lead? For instance, do you recommend making a term offer or a lease option offer? Any other type of offer? Well, it depends on your business model. Now, my business model is, is I want to buy 65 cents on the dollar of the ads is value. And I'm going to wholetail it, which means I'm going to put it on the multiple listing service instantly. And I'm going to flip that thing without doing any work to it to somebody that does want to do the work, either sweat equity or hire that work out and turn it into a rental or maybe flip it again. And I'm okay with that because I'm buying it based upon an as-is value and I'm buying it 65 cents on the, on the dollar of as-is. Where most people calculate the ARV, they'll go 70 times ARV minus repairs. I don't do that. I think that formula is flawed. You're actually paying more for a house when you use that formula over my, my formula, which is ARV minus 2 times R times 65 cents. We teach all, of, all about the formulas and how you can make sure that you're actually valuing property correctly. Remember, when you get a house under contract, the first thing you do is try to kick the deal for yourself. Okay, so the seller said it was worth 130 Now go find out if it is because we don't, we don't worry about what it's worth until after we have a contract. Then we fight to get rid of the contract. And that's a crazy perspective. But if we can kill a deal, we'd rather kill the deal in the beginning than have that deal killed for us after we've spent time and resource determining value. So if we can kill the deal based upon the pictures, based upon the algorithms and the seven data sets, then we're going to do that. And we'll teach you all about how to do that in the coaching program. And then from there, we go to a BPO, broker's price opinion. We're going to hire a real estate real estate agent in the area to give us a price opinion, not a CMA compared to market analysis, but a BPO, which is a more in-depth physical inspection of the property. And then from there, we're going to open up escrow or open up closing. We're going to get a prelim, make sure the seller can actually sell us the house. Believe it or not, some people don't even own the house they're trying to sell. Sometimes that person's been dead, unfortunately. Sometimes... Situations occurred where they didn't get title to the property correctly or there was a spouse involved that didn't release their interest, those kinds of things. So we want to make sure we get a prelim and that the seller can actually sell the property because we spent 150 bucks on the the BPO. We don't want to go into the pre without that confirming value. And then the the pre is going to confirm whether or not we can buy it. And then we're going to get a home inspection, 350, 400 bucks, four and a quarter, depending on where it's at, how big a house. And then from there, we're going to get a full board appraisal. So we're going to spend about a grand on the house in determining its value and what it's worth and whether or not we want to buy it. And, but I'll do that. I want to protect my dollar. Keep in mind, I'm buying that $200,000 house for a maximum of 130. So I have 70 grand in there. So I'm going to spend a, a thousand of the 70 to make sure that the other 69 is actually going to come back to me. Of course, minus expenses. And I know I have eight and a quarter percent expenses when I buy and sell a house not including the holding time. If I have a long hold period, then I'm going to have more than that. But that's why we do 65 cents. We try to get it to there. Sometimes we'll do 60 cents. Sometimes we'll do 50 cents. We won't on purpose negotiate someone past 50 cents. We can. We know how to do it. But I'm not going to take someone past 50 cents because at 50 cents, I can make good money. I don't need to take someone down to 45 just because I can. Remember the old saying, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. 
It has to be a win-win fair situation for both parties, you and the seller. We're going to train you how to negotiate from a an honest perspective. As I tell you what, when you negotiate based upon truth, when it's truth-based negotiation, so much easier. So much easier. You don't have to worry about lying, not telling the truth, telling, you know, fibs kind of thing, not telling everything you should tell. Treating people like you'd want to be treated. That's basically what we do is we teach how to not negotiate through truth. It's a good way to negotiate. Do you make other types of offers? I don't, but you could. If your business model was saying, hey, I'm going to buy everything on a marginal equity position. So maybe you buy, you can buy stuff at 80% or greater. But I'll, if I do that, I'm only going to take subject to or seller financing. No money down, no repairs required. Because it's an important concept. If the more repairs you have, the less those marginal deals make any sense. Even if you go, you know, 80 times or 85 times ARV minus repairs, it doesn't make any sense because you're going to put a bucket load of money out to fix it all up, get someone to live there. And then, so if you don't have any repairs and you're at 80 cents or greater and you're doing seller financing, sub two financing, no cash outlay, yeah, you can make that make sense. You can make 50 grand on that deal over a five year period. We'll teach you how to do that. I don't do that because I don't want that long term passive income. But, but let's face it, sometimes in some areas, especially in the old days, that's all we could do because nothing had equity. So we had to build the equity with time. You know, you get, you'd get 10 houses. I tell you what, it's easier to buy a house at 80 cents on the dollar than it is 65 cents. We can buy those all day long, 80 cents all day long. You know, that's, that's, I think that's where, you know, when I wrote my book on sub two, that's kind of where sub two came from. So the marginal transactions, people were buying sub two at an 85, 90 cent on the dollar value. So there wasn't enough to pay an Pay, use a real estate professional and get their house sold, but they needed to sell. So a buyer would go in there and buy that property and turn it into a seller resale passive wraparound mortgage. And you'd make some spread on the mortgage interest rates. You'd make some spread on the, the wrap. You'd make some spread on the down payment. You'd make some spread on the inflated cost in the future. And you'd make some spread on the, the pay down difference between the terms of the, of the mortgages. So yeah, you make 50 grand if you want. It just, does it fit in your business model? If it does, go for it. And we'll show you how to do lease options. We'll do it. show you how to do sandwiches. Show you how to do all kinds of stuff in the coaching program. Question number four. On the sell side, what systems do you have in place to sell the properties or do you re rely heavily on the MLS and local agents? What if the property does not sell as a wholesale property? Is there another approach? Absolutely, just like I just spoke about. We're gonna put it on the MLS instantly. Remember when we try to kick the deal, once we get it under contract, we're looking at days on market. We're looking at inventory basis. We're looking at types of inventory that are on the market. Are they all REOs? Those kinds of things. What the values have been doing in that marketplace? Is it seasonal? Are we having it weather issues? Those kinds of things. So we're going we're gonna to try to take all that stuff into consideration. But yeah, we're going to buy a house every once in a while that we can't get rid of. I got a couple of them across the country. No big deal. I'll just rent them out, turn them into passive income if I need to. I'm going to offer seller financing if I need to. I mean, most of my stuff's free and clear. So, yeah, there's all kinds of things you can do. The best approach is to wholesale it, though, get your money back out of it. But I'm not crazy. I'm on an asset sitting over there, ten buck two, and not making any money. So, I'll put a I'll put a tenant in there. I'll put a buyer tenant buyer in there. I don't have an issue with that. But it's not my first line of defense. My first line of defense is to put it on the MLS, cause the MLS to sell, and I know majority of the time that happens. And if I have to reduce it a little bit to cause it to sell, I'll do that too. But now I'm not going to hold on to inventory. We're going to figure out how to sell them. That's creative approach to real estate investing. And we, we cover this stuff in coaching program. Great question. Question number five. I have a question regarding the median sales price. Let's say I'm looking for one to three bedroom homes in Van Nuys, California, where median prices are 535. Based on Trulia, in my research of homes, do I target homes with maximum value of 535? Or do I look for homes with a percentage value below 535? The reason I ask is the 535 in the median houses, blah, 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 is not, we are not looking for four bedrooms. Strange question, but I think what he's trying to qu question here is all of the students run an algorithm. I'll back up a little bit. We run an algorithm to determine the better areas to market to. And one of the components when we're looking at the numbers and that are coming back to us is I want to know how many units are in a, a zip code, but I want to know how many of those units have an equity position. 30% or greater. Then I want to take that number and I want to know how many of those have a median value not exceeding median, two-thirds of median, and the bottom of third of median. So I'm going to I'm going to take the median group, and it's in this case 535, 
and I'm going to figure out zero dollars to what's a what's a third of five thirty five kind of thing, and then from that number, what's the the middle, the two thirds, and then the, finally the top. If I have a lot of my inventory in the two thirds and below, I'm real happy with that zip code. Now, some of the other parts of the zip code say could say that they're giving me better indicators, and I don't want to use that number as strong as I typically would like, but that would be rare. But an area, let's assume for a second, I have 3,000 houses that are 535 or, or greater that have a 30% equity base or larger. 2,000 of them are in the top third from a median value. I know that market, I only have a third of the houses that can appreciate organically because the higher priced houses are gonna pull the lower priced houses up with it. So they're gonna pull them. Well, that's not as advantageous for me as if I went into a marketplace, let's say I still had the same 3,000. And 2,000 of the houses were in the two-thirds or lower and 1,000 were in the, in the higher. Because the 1,000 are still gonna pull the 2,000 houses. But I have more houses which increases my funnel. It's all about filling up that funnel. You know, in a case where, so let's say for instance, all of the houses, all of the 3,000 were in the top tier already. I, I might be a little apprehensive in marketing to that, spend a lot of money in that if I had other zip codes that proved that those zip codes were better for me. But when we run our marketing algorithms, we're looking at a lot of different data feeds to us. Things like, you'll get, you know, how many units are in a you know, zip code? How many cash buyers are in that zip code per month that are investors? How many REOs we have? How many foreclosures we have? What our days on market is? what our median sales price is, how many, how many pieces of inventory have a, an equity position, a bunch of different numbers coming back at us so we can have some, not guesswork here, we can have some pretty good educated or an educated approach to determining the market that we want to market to. Because let's face it, if we're going to spend $1,000 on marketing, where do we spend it? Do we spend it on a market where there's not a lot of inventory that has an equity position or do we spend it on a market that has a lot of equity position? I, well, I'm going to say, that I'm going to, market to the one that has a lot of equity position. What if we had two units, two areas that they both had a lot of equity position, but one had a low inventory of REOs and pre-foreclosures, and the other one had a high inventory of REOs and pre-foreclosures? Which one do you market to? Or what if we had, they were both the same, so they both had low inventory of REOs and pre-foreclosures, but one had 120 days on the market and the other had 54 days on market? Which one do you market to? Or what if you had the same amount of inventory, all the characteristics were the same, but the one in one zip code, there were 12,000 houses, and the another zip code, there were only 4,000 houses. Which one do you market to? You know, if in one market, there was a cash investor purchase one in every 200 houses, and in one market, there's a cash investor purchase of one in every 300 houses, which one do you market to? Well, we go over all the reasons one is better than the other one. So when you look at a market, you can determine what market you want to market to to have the highest rate of success. I tell you what, guys and gals, it's working really great. It's a great algorithm. It's a great. So if one of the first things we do in our coaching program is we determine your market so that we're not guessing at potential income. This is a business-based system, and we have to do things on purpose. Great question. Sorry about the first one to be in a commercial. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Hope your football team won. Until next time, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.